Uh, flying in space does some amazing things to the human body. When you take away gravity, uh, a lot of things that, that we take for granted suddenly change. Something as simple as balance. I mean, how do you know which way's up? Uh, how do you correlate what your balance system and your eyes are telling you? They're, they're suddenly telling you something that's very different. Your eyes say you're in a room, your inner ear says you're falling. Your blood pressure regulation. Um, the fact that the blood doesn't pool down in your legs anymore because there's no gravity pushing it down there. Uh, even our immune system's depressed and, and our bones start to get absorbed back into our, uh, our bloodstream. There's, there's a whole vast number of things that happen when we move into no gravity. And a lot of them look like people getting older or, or people that are bedridden. So that's a long preamble, but the reason is uh, we can use the, the transition to weightlessness and then the recovery from coming back to Earth as a great laboratory to study how the body controls these things. How do we control osteoporosis? How does our heart regulate its size and strength? How do we control blood pressure and balance and, and all of those things? So we, we have a, a whole suite of experiments on board. Everything from uh, ultrasound of the heart. Uh, I'm trained as an ultrasound technician, working with an expert on the ground. I'll be doing ultrasounds on the other cosmonaut and astronaut's hearts and vice versa. Um, looking at how my body will react to sudden changes in blood pressure, just as if you stood up or lay down um, using a, a device that's um, invented at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we're looking at how the actual blood chemistry changes using a new invention called microflow, where not only is this looking at the human blood, but also it's, it's a, a space-driven invention to be able to just take a tiny bit of blood and do basically a real-time analysis of what's inside the blood. Uh, in a system developed uh, in Quebec, which has real promise. Uh, gosh, there's a whole suite of experiments going on, taking advantage of these uh, these 75 kilogram lab rats that are up there to try and, and learn as much as we can from the experience. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it's it's a new exploration for humanity. We're leaving our planet for the first time. We have a whole universe to learn, and we have to figure out how to. Um, comfortably and reliably leave Earth for a long period. We have to be able to go away and know that, that our solutions are going to keep us healthy. So a lot of this experiment we're, we're doing up there is for that. And so as an astronaut, it's, it's just one of the things you do. But also it has direct application to people back on Earth, the, uh, the older folks that uh, have osteoporosis. Why does that happen, and how does your body regulate osteoporosis, and what countermeasures, whether it's diet or exercise or impact with the ground or foot strikes or whatever, what are some of the ways to, to beat osteoporosis? How do we take care of the people who have, um, who have balance problems? How does that wonderful uh, inner ear interact with our eyes and the bottoms of our feet to truly tell us which way's up? And there's a whole suite of experiments because we lab rats have an instantaneous change in orbit that we can't study any other way. It's almost as if they're dissecting us to be able to see those things. So uh, part of being an astronaut is flying spaceships, but part of it is, is being a lab rat, and that's okay. Oh, a big change. Uh, when I rode back on my first shuttle flight, uh, I did an experiment while we were coming back into the atmosphere, so we started to feel gravity again. I closed my eyes, and I tipped my head to the side. and my body didn't know what to do with gravity and it felt completely convincingly like I was suddenly accelerating sideways like someone had put me on a on a I don't know a cart in a shopping store and suddenly thrown me sideways or I tipped my head backwards and I was convinced I was doing backwards somersaults and and uh, my body was just so confused and so I sat there with my eyes open so I would know which 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 way was up uh, and when I got back to Earth, I could walk around fine, so long as I had my eyes open. When I closed them, I, I would immediately fall over. But my kids were little then. I could uh, reach out, pick up one of my kids, and actually balance, you know, holding that weight away from me, but only with my eyes open. And it takes, some things only take minutes, some takes hours, some take days or weeks to recover until basically after about one day on Earth for every day in space, you're sort of back to normal again and you've recovered from the experience. Well, I look at this mission uh, really in, in two different ways. One is, is professional. I've uh, been an astronaut for 20 years. I, I was chosen by the Canadian Space Agency just a little over 20 years ago. I've trained and worked through all those years, supported all the other uh, flights, the shuttle flights and the Canadians that have flown. I've had a chance to fly twice on the shuttle. And if you, if you build a professional astronaut's career, they all 
sort of head towards this chance I'm having now to live in space for a long time, five months or more, and to command a spaceship. So professionally, this is both extremely challenging, but also immensely rewarding for me. And, and I'm, I hope I can do it right, because I've been working at it for a long time. But personally, it is, it is just so exciting. It's the ultimate ride at the fair. It is, it is uh, the chance to do everything I dreamed of since I was a, a little kid, hoping someday I, I might get to be an astronaut, to, to have the huge luxury of, of uh, months and months of weightlessness, to go around the world, I think it's 2,500 times or something, uh, to get to know our whole planet like I know uh, where I grew up, to, to see 16 sunrises a day for all of those days just the incredible privilege of being one of the first people to leave Earth. It is every every dream I had as a little kid coming true, and I still feel that same surreal giddiness now that uh, that any nine-year-old boy would who, who's climbing on board a rocket ship. So so for me, it's both. Uh, time is scheduled. The whole five months is scheduled down to five-minute increments for us. We have a whole team on the ground in mission controls all around the world, um, that are trying to make sure that everybody's getting their money's worth and that we're not just sitting around in space or floating around. But there are times when we, just after we wake up, before we go to bed, and uh, while we're asleep, of course, that they don't have things scheduled for us. But also, uh, on the weekends, there's a little bit of relaxation time. Um, and so I've got a, you know, a list of things that I want to do. But high on my list is, uh, is music. I'm, I'm a musician on Earth. I play in two bands. I've written music and played music uh, for years and years. I'm working collaboratively with uh, Ed Robertson of the Bare Naked Ladies um, for a song that'll be in schools all across Canada this year. Um, and I'm going to record the experience through music, just as other astronauts have recorded it through pictures, uh, recorded it through uh, blogs and, and journals. Um, I'm hoping to be able to do my best to capture some of the experience artistically through music. And that's what I'll be doing in my spare time. Uh, on board the space station right now is a guitar that was made in Vancouver by the Larry Vey Company. It's a, it's a little parlor guitar. I, I didn't have anything to do with it getting on board, but it's a Canadian guitar on the International Space Station. Just, it just happened to be the right guitar at the right time when, when they bought it. And it's been in orbit uh, for over 60,000 orbits. It is the ultimate, uh, you know, around the world tour instrument. And um, and it's up there waiting, but I've made sure that we have all of the other equipment necessary with pickups and recording equipment and microphones that hopefully we can get uh, some pretty good sound and, and not just uh, write some music up there, but make something that, that's, uh, that's reasonable to listen to on YouTube and, and, and try and maybe write some of the songs that will help capture this early human experience, this, this first uh, sailing out of sight of land as, as far as the rest of the universe goes. I think the the real most important thing to, to to look at here is that when I decided to be an astronaut, it was impossible. It wasn't hard. Canada had no astronaut program. You couldn't be an astronaut. Uh, but I figured, well, things change with time, and, and things are never always going to look the same as they do now. So I, I'm going to get myself ready and see what happens. And now I've flown twice in space, and assuming things go right, I'm going to command a spaceship. It's so. It's really easy, especially with the onslaught of information we get, to believe that, that the problems we have right now are new in the human experience and they're, they're unsolvable and we can't possibly do anything about them and, and the future is predestined or something. And, and I, I think people should look to the exploration that we're doing on the space station and beyond as a pretty good example of, uh, of the huge opportunity that lies out there and the things that can happen when... Uh, uh, devoted and smart people apply time to it, and and the fact that um, that for your kids, for for Canadians across the country, um, just because something can't happen right now, just because it's a dream right now, doesn't mean it can't come true.